Hey folks, well, welcome back for more fun with Lisp. Uh, this time around, I want to get into the most common of the composite data structures. So these are things like sequences and lists and vectors. Um, these are things you're going to be working with all the time in Lisp, and they're they're really kind of the core of what builds up most of the, the compound data types that we work with. So I'm going to spend a fair bit of time talking about these over the course of the term. For, uh, for now, we'll just get into the fundamentals of each of the, the core data types. So, what have we got here? Um, the idea is you've got this hierarchy of types. Sequence is the most general uh, form of... If, you, if you've got a collection of data and you want to just drop them in a... Uh, a well, a sequence is the best way to, to describe it. Just coming up with a, an ordered set of of data items, sequence is the most generic form. So what you're going to wind up doing is seeing a hierarchy of these different data types where lists are a subtype of sequences, if you like, and we're going to do a lot of work with lists. Vectors, um, arrays, oh, I left arrays out of that list. Arrays are a subtype of sequences. Vectors are a subtype of arrays. So. I guess maybe the best way to show this is actually with a little picky here. Let's do this instead. So what you can see here is that our most generic type for our collections are sequences. And then sequences can be either lists or arrays. And arrays can be one-dimensional or multi-dimensional. And then vectors are, if you like, a subset of arrays. Bit vectors and strings are each subsets of vectors. So if you've got a function that'll work on sequences, it'll work on anything in this collection. A function that's designed for lists will just work on lists. A function that's designed for arrays will work on arrays or vectors or bit vectors or strings, etc., etc., etc. So we've got this kind of hierarchy. And for each of them, the idea is you've just got this ordered collection of data values. And the individual data values, for the most part, can be almost anything. Once we get down to, to bit vectors and strings, it's a little different. But for the most part, sequences can be made up of um, a collection of any kind of data items. So if you've got a, a list, for instance, it might the first element of your list might be a number, and the second one might be a string, and the third one might be another, maybe an integer, and the fourth one might be a char, who knows what. So... Uh, the fifth one might be a list, the sixth one might be a vector, right? So you've just got this ordered collection of elements that can each be of any data type whatsoever. All right. So we've got this collection of different data types available to us. Working with them is going to look similar in a lot of ways with all the different data types, but of course there are custom functions built for each of the different data types specifically. So the general sequence is to show in the round brackets just the series of data values you want to be in that thing, in the array or in the, the list or in the vector or whatever it might be. So, you know, for instance, here maybe we've got a variable x as our first element, the integer 10, the string foo, the number, the float 3.5. So you can have this sequence of data values, but we've got this problem. If you see that kind of a syntax, the way we've been using it so far is for a function call, where you've got the function call in brackets, and the name of the function is the first thing in that sequence. So if I was just to throw this in the middle of a Lisp program someplace, Lisp is going to think, oh, you're making a function call, and the name of the function is x. So if I want to tell Lisp that I want this to be data, right, a sequence, a list, a vector, or whatever, and not a function call, I've got to have some way of telling it that. Um, oh, actually, just as an aside, you can quite happily have empty lists. And nil is actually an alternative uh, way of describing the empty list. But I'll come back to that in just a second. So, um, let's see. Jeez, I drifted off topic here. Okay, well, <laughs> should have structured this better. We've got uh, 
it's possible to have lists inside of lists, again, vectors inside of lists, lists inside of lists inside of arrays, inside of lists, and a whole slew of different type checking functions available for these. So a list p to see is something a list, string p, is it a string, vector p, is it a vector? Um, so if something is a string, then uh, array p will say yes, it's an array, vector p will say yes, it's a vector, and string p will say yes, it's a string, just because these are all sub, or they're subtypes of one another. But the uh, point I wanted to get into was this idea of being able to distinguish a function call from a list or from a sequence. And the way we do it is with a quote. There's actually a quote function where you say, the thing that's coming next isn't a function call, it's data. So if you have this quote function, and you say quote, and then whatever your list of data happens to be, Lisp is going to know, ah, I'm not going to treat that as a function call. Now, just as a shorthand way of doing this, so we don't have all these quote functions in there, you can actually use a single quote in front of your list or in front of your data to do the same thing. A single quote basically says, don't try and evaluate this next thing as a function call, or actually as a symbol when we get to that, but there's a variety of other contexts. So quote is essentially saying, you know, don't, don't try and evaluate this next thing that's coming up. So now we've got a way of going through and telling Lisp when we want to use something as data and when we want to use something as a function call. So actually, let's just confirm some of those things a little bit. So let's say we fire up our interpreter. And actually, let's go back and, and just double check that idea that, you know, is nil really the same thing as our empty list? So here I've got my single quote to indicate that this next thing is data and not a function call. And again, it's an empty list in this case. And we're going through and saying, okay, is nil really the empty list? And if you remember, EQ was our strictest form of equality testing. Hey, it is. Okay. And again, if I say something like SQRT of 35, it thinks that's calling the function square root of 35. If I throw a single quote in front of that, it's going to think that this is just some list of information. You know, the SQRT is just a symbol of some kind, and the 35 is a number buried within a list. All right, so it just gives me back the list that I gave it. So, and again, you can use the quote function to do the same thing, sqrt35, and it just gives me back the list. So now I've got a way of telling Lisp when I do or don't want something evaluated. Now, this uh, is a good point to talk about a few of the more common syntax errors that we're going to run across. So when you're playing with things, the most common errors that you're going to run across, especially in the, the first few weeks, are uh, simply placing the, use, writing our function calls as if they were sort of a C or a Java style function call, where you meant to run function f on uh, value x and you write it as f and then in brackets the x. Again, just the, the syntax that we're most used to dealing with. So again, the correct syntax as far as Lisp is concerned is to have the name of the function as the first thing inside the brackets. Uh, again, bracketing issues are big in Lisp. You want to use an editor that does bracket checking for you. So extra brackets, missing brackets. Actually, I put together a little video that, that's got just a whole bunch of different examples of common programming errors and what it looks like when you try and run a script that's got those errors in them. Uh, doing things like forgetting to type check your parameters. So, you know, you've got some function that's going to add two values together and you forget to make sure that they're numbers before you try adding them. The ones we were just mentioning here, putting a quote in front of something that you meant as a function call, or forgetting to put a quote in front of something that you meant to be treated as data. All right, so again, those are extremely common, just forgetting or adding a quote, forgetting or adding a bracket, um, misplacing your the name of the function, Right? These are all things that you're going to get used to as pretty common debugging problems.
Uh, just again, I think I mentioned this a few minutes ago, but there are a couple of other contexts where we will run into the use of the quote telling Lisp not to evaluate something. So if you throw it in front of an identifier, it's basically saying just treat this as an identifier. Don't try and look up whatever the value of it is. So for instance, if we, uh, let me just fire up our handy dandy interpreter again here for a second. If I do something like create a variable x and set it to value 10, if I just say x, it's going to evaluate it and say, ah, oh, well, yeah, x is 10, here you go. If I want to look at the symbol itself rather than the value associated with it, I throw the single quote in front and it's going to come back and say, oh, yeah, your symbol is x which doesn't seem terribly useful right now, but that'll actually become really handy when we start writing code that's manipulating code. So we'll come back to that in a couple of weeks. All right. So the top layer of our type hierarchy, we said, were the sequences. And there are a bunch of built-in functions that operate on sequences that are going to be really handy. So again, these work on any of the other types as well. So length, we'll go through and look up the number of elements in something. ELT for element, and then the sequence that you're looking at, and then an integer position gives you back um, a copy of the ith element of that sequence. So this is kind of like look, using an array index. And again, it's zero indexed. So zero is the first element, one is the second, two is the, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So i's got to be an integer. Um, actually, off the top of my head, I can't remember what it does with uh, if we give it something like a negative value. Let's just, why not? We'll give that a quick try. So if I say something like, uh, well, what's the length of 10, 20, 30? Again, this is going to come back and tell me the length is 3. If I look at a specific element in there, so if I say what's the you know second element, so that should be the 30, yay. Um, if I ask for the third element, so if I go out of bounds, it's going to complain and yell at me. So I'm going to go back to the top level there. And so I'm assuming then that if I give it a negative value, it's going to yell at me. Yeah, OK. All right. Just had to confirm that. All right, so we've got length, we've got ELT to look up a specific position. You can actually use setf and ELT to go through and set the value in a position. So this is one of the more unusual aspects of things like ELT and setf, is that um, we can actually use it to alter the ith element of a sequence, whether, again, whether it's a list or an array or a vector or whatever. Uh, some of the other built-in beasties, you can count how many times a particular element appears in a sequence. You can remove all the copies of an element from a sequence. You can make a copy of a sequence. So this becomes important when we're going through and when we genuinely want uh, a true copy of something and not just to have two ways of referring to the same thing. So by default, if I just assign one sequence to another, so one list to another, for instance, it's actually going to make the two of them refer to the same list. It's not truly making a duplicate. So maybe this is a good place to uh, just quickly illustrate that. So if I go through and create a list L1, and then I go through and make what use def var, so I'm going to assign L1 to L2. So it kind of looks like we're making a copy of L1 and calling it L2, but what it's really doing is making both of them refer to that original list. So if I was to just print that out first off, just to make sure we've got a copy here. So let's print out, let's say L1 is tilde A, L2 is tilde A, and I'll throw in a new line there, L1 and L2. Then it tells us that they're, they both look pretty much the same. Now let's use that setf. And what we'll do 
is let's set the first element of L1 to 7 or some such thing. So the element in position 0 will set to the value 7. And now if we go back and print L1 and L2 again, we'll see that they're both 7. So they really are referring to the same list. So what we would probably like if we want L2 to be a separate copy of L1 is to say, okay, let's make L2 a copy of L1. And now, if we do that same sort of a set F, so let's go set the first element of L1 to 20, and we'll print them both out again. Now we see that L1 has changed, but L2 hasn't. So we've actually got a true duplicate as opposed to just both of them referring to the same thing. All right, so I drifted a little off to the side there, but again, it is important to, notice, to note that uh, by default, this is doing kind of a shallow copy. And if you want a deep copy, you use copy sequence. Alrighty, there's a sort function where you can say sort this sequence and you tell it what kind of an operator you want to use to sort it. So, you know, maybe things like I want to sort in uh, ascending order, so I use uh, less than for numbers, or I want to sort it in uh, um, decreasing order, so I pass it greater than for the operator. And so again, the sequence is sort the S, and this is one of those cases where we throw the quote in saying, okay, here, what's coming up next is the symbol for the operator that I want to use. So we're actually passing the operator as a parameter. So you can basically say sort this data and pass it whatever kind of comparison operation is right for the sort of sorting results that you want. Uh, you can concatenate sequences. So again, concatenate is referring to sequences so you can get it to concatenate and produce different specific types of sequence, so a list or a vector or whatever. So you specify what kind of sequence you're trying to produce and the two things that you want to concatenate together. So if I have two strings I want to concatenate together, then this might be concatenate and then quote string and then the first string and the second string. And again, it just returns a uh, new string that's got the contents of the first one and the contents of the second one. All right, then there's a bunch of functions that are list specific. So cons will go through and create a new list that's got an element E followed by the elements that were in another list L. So this is basically gluing one new element on the front. Car is kind of doing the opposite. It's grabbing the front element from a list. And cutter is kind of like a tail op. So car you can think of as sort of a head. And cutter you can think of as a tail. So CDR is going through and returns a list that's got everything from L except that front element. So just to uh, kind of confirm some of that, um, I guess we've still got our our two lists, L1 and L2. So let's go through and let's set, um, I don't know, let's set, let's create a new variable. Def of our L3. And so what we're going to do for L3 is we're going to cons a string foo onto the contents of L1. All right, so we've got L3. Let's just take a look at what's in L3. And so now we've got that new element and the old contents of L1. So we, uh, um, we can create new lists by adding an element at the front. And again, if we go through and take a look at the car of L3 now, this should give me back that first element. If I look at the cutter of L3, that should give me everything except the first element. All right, so it gives me back a list. So these are pretty typical. Um, nth is specific for lists, but it lets you look up what's in a specific position in a list. So again, the first position of L3 should be my foo. Uh, 
So you can go through and specify things by position. You can get the last element of a list. So in this case, that's the three. You can see if something is in a list. So is uh, three, for instance, in L3. And it says yes. Is 10 in L3. And it comes back with a no. You can append lists. So let's see what we get from appending L1 and L2. And it gives me the, it creates a new list that's a combination of the two of them. All right, so there are a whole slew of different built-in list functions that we'll uh, be playing with. Now, there are some built-in combinations. There are gonna be times when you wanna do things like look up the head of the tail of a list or the head of the head of a list. And so ordinarily what we would be doing are things like, well, if I wanna see the front element of the tail of a list, then the tail of the list is that CDR, the cutter. And so the front element of that would be the car of the cutter. And you know, if you wanted to look up the head of the head of the head, if you had a list as the first element of a list that was the first element of a list or some such thing, then you could look at the car of the car of the car or the car of the cutter of the car. And it gets, when you're using these functions often enough, it gets a little tedious to write them out in that full form. So Lisp actually builds in a bunch of shorthand versions of these. And it just takes the middle layer, the middle letter, to indicate what's going on. So things like the C-A-D-R, of L, the catter of L, is saying, take the head, the car, of the tail, the cutter of L. So, the car of the cutter of L. Or if I wanted to take the tail of the head of L, the cutter of the car of L. Or the tail of the tail would be the cutter of the cutter of L. So these things are built in, and you can have up any combination of up to three A's and D's in the, the middle here. Um, if you're wondering why cars and cutters uh, this actually comes from way back in the original implementation of these things back in the 60s where uh, they used a register to hold the first element and a register to hold a pointer to the rest of the list. And so that first one was called the content address register and the second one was called the content decrement register and so hence the CAR and the CDR. So a um, little unusual. Often folks will refer to things as the head for that front element and the tail for everything else. So however you, uh, you feel like referring to it, it is, it's functions that you're going to get used to playing with a lot in Lisp. Okay, uh, actually, maybe I should uh, just play with those a second just to make sure that this does look sort of familiar. So if I take something like uh, let's look at the head. Well, actually, first off, let, let's look at the tail blah, of the tail of L1, for instance. So this is that inside one is chopping off the front element, and then this is chopping off the, the front element of whatever's left. So we should get everything but the front two elements of L1. Or if we do something similar with L3, again, chopping off every, giving us everything except those front two elements of L3. If you've got, let's say, a list inside a list, so let's look at the front element of the front element of a list. So let's say our list has a list as the front element. So we've got a list one, two, three that's in the front of a list. 20, 30, or some such thing. Um, how many brackets have I got open here? Uh, so that means that, 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 something like that. So this is going in and saying, okay, that inner car is grabbing the front element of this, of the big list, and so the front element of the big list is that list. And so the outer car is saying, okay, well, grab the front element of that, so it's giving me the one. Or if I was to do something like, you know, give me the tail of that front element, 
And it's saying, okay, go through and grab that front element and give me everything in that except the head element. Now, car and cutter will crash if you give it something that uh, isn't valid. So let's say if I give this an empty list. Oh, it won't crash. Hey, woohoo! What happens if I take the tail of that? Okay, what happens if I take the tail of the tail? Hey, what do you know? I thought it was going to crash on me. Learn something new every day. All right. So we've got cars and cutters that we can play with. Let's slide over to some of the other built-in function types. So for vectors, there's a special function to go through and create a vector. So you can build... This is like a, a one-dimensional array. So you can go through and specify, I want a one-dimensional array. And these are actually implemented a little bit more efficiently behind the scenes that's got these values in it. All right, so again, create a vector. Remember we had nth for setting the nth element of a list, and we had ELT for setting a specific element by position in a sequence. There's another one that's custom built for vectors. And again, if you use the one that's built specifically for a data type, it's just a little bit more efficient because it's designed specifically for that data type. They'll, the others will work as well. But So SVREF to set the value of a vector, or pardon me, to uh, look up the value of a what's in a specific position in a vector. So if my vector is v and I want to look up what's in the ith position, again zero based, I can use svref. And if I want to set what's in that position, I use setf, and then the look up for that position and the new value. And again, any of the array and any of the sequence functions will work. We'll uh, talk about the array functions in just a sec. Uh, let's see, what else do we have? We are going to do a lot of playing with uh, with lists. Uh, this is going to be one of the most common ways that we store collections of data or that we build up data structures. So this is going to involve a lot of recursion, a lot of using conses to build things and cars and cutters to decompose lists. So you are going to get used to this sort of an idea. You know, if I want to go through and write a function that's going to uh, return a count of how many elements are in a list, for instance. This is basically what length would be doing. So if I wanted to go off and count all the elements in some list L, all right, the first thing I want to do is make sure that L is actually a list. So if L is not a list, all right, so if L is not a list, then whatever you know, I can return error or nil or whatever it is I want as my, uh, my error case then my base case would be if the list is empty, right? So if L, if we get past that first one, then L is actually a list. Is it empty? Is it null? In which case we'll return zero, right? There's nothing in it. Otherwise, so my default case is I want to basically chop off the front element, do a recursive call and see, you know, how many elements are in the rest of the list and just add one. So I do a recursive call, how many elements are in the rest of the list, you know, minus that first element, and add one. And so this is a pretty common structure. Um, again, similar idea. Suppose I want to write my own, and again, this is pretty much what append is actually going to wind up doing, but uh, suppose I wanted to write an append function, then I want to take two lists as parameters, and I want to create a new list that's got the contents of all of the elements from both of them. Right, with all the ones of L1 first, and then all the ones of L2 afterwards. So I'm going to create my append function. Um, I'm going to specify my two parameters of these two lists. Again, the first thing I want to do is do my error checking, make sure that they are actually lists. So if L1 is not a list, or L2 is not a list, then return whatever my error value is. Um, I'm just returning nil here. You could have an error symbol or whatever it is you want to do for uh, um, for the error case. So make sure that they're both lists. If one of them's empty, then the result of the append would just be the other one. So if L1 is empty, then we'll just return L2, right? Because there's no elements of L1 to add to it. And otherwise, if L2 is empty, then we'll just return whatever L1 is. 
If they both happen to be empty, this works out anyways, because if L1 is empty, it's going to return L2, which if it was empty would be an empty list, which is exactly what we'd want. So this works for the, the base case. So the last case we've got to consider is where there's actually content in both of them. So what I'm going to do to set up a recursive structure is to say, well, what I want is the first element of L1 followed by everything else. So everything else would be what we would get if we appended the rest or appended L2 to the end of the rest of L1. And that's exactly what we're going to do here. We're going to make a recursive call to append and say what I want to string together are the contents of the rest of L1 followed by all of L2 and then I'll stick the first element of L1 on the front, which is going to give me exactly what I want. All right, so this is going to go through and gradually sort of as the recursion goes along, we're going to pull off one element of L1 and make a recursive call on the rest. That recursive call is going to pull off the second element of L1 and make a recursive call on the, on the rest. And then that one's going to make a recursive, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We just keep making these recursive calls, pulling off one element at a time from L1. Eventually, we hit the case where L1's empty. There's nothing left in it which just gives us back L2. And then as the recursion unwinds, we're gluing those elements of L1 back on. So if I had my list one, two, three, then the deepest call would be the where I append three to L2. And then that would return and I'd append, or I'd cons, pardon me, I'd, I'd cons three to L2 and return that. And then that would cons two to the result and return that, and that would cons the one to the result and return that, and I would actually get the result I want. So my recursion will unwind. I know that my layers of recursion are going to be linear in the size of L1, right? so I know this is actually going to work out. And this is a pretty typical sort of append structure. And this is a lot of what we wind up doing, is coming up with an appropriate recursive structure to get the functionality that we want. Uh, throw in one more here just to, uh, to keep practicing with some of this stuff. If we want to go through and reverse the elements of a list, what I'm going to do this time is throw in a helper function that's going to make uh, life a little bit easier. So what we'll do is as we're going through the elements of L, we'll build up a list of what we've reversed so far. So let's say that uh, I've got this list one, two, three that I want to reverse. I'm going to go through the elements of the list and I'm going to have this extra parameter that keeps track of how far I've gotten so far. So the first thing I'm going to do is my kind of public facing version of reverse is going to say, okay, you know, give me the list you want reversed. I'll do that quick error check. If it's not a list, then I'll return whatever my error value is supposed to be. Otherwise, I'm going to call this helper function, pass it the list that I want reversed, and so far I haven't reversed anything, so I'm just going to pass it the empty list to get it started with. So my helper function is going to take the list that it still has to process, the elements that it's still got to process, and the elements that it's processed so far. And what it's going to do is say, if there are no elements left to process, then just give me back whatever I've built up so far. Right? If there's nothing left to do, then I've already computed the answer. I'll just return it. So this is my base case. Otherwise, what I want to do is make a recursive call where I'm going to say, OK, reverse the tail of the stuff I've still got to process. And for whatever I've built up so far, Stick my, stick the head of this, elem, or the, the head of this onto everything else that I've built up. So, if we uh, go through and have a bit of a play with this, actually, let me just uh, let me just do it this way. Let's say. So we'll just kind of sketch it out. So let's say I'm trying to do something like a reverse of uh, 
one, two, three. So what this is going to wind up doing is it is actually a list. So it's going to say, let's call reverse help on my list. One, two, three. And what I've reversed so far. So my um, the list that I want reversed and what I've processed so far. I haven't done anything so far. And that reverse help is going to go through and say, okay, well, I've still got elements that I have to process. So I'm going to call reverse help on everything but the front element. And I'm going to cons that front element onto what I've built up so far. So I'm going to cons that one, the one that I pulled off here, I add it to my empty list, the front of my empty list. And then that next layer is going to keep going and it's going to say, okay, well now I'm going to pull the two off and append it to the answer I've built up so far. And that next one is going to pull the three off and cons it to the front of what I've built up so far. And that one is going to say, oh, wait, I've got no elements left to process, so I'm just going to return the 3, 2, 1. And so that 3, 2, 1 will get returned back up the chain. And so we get the actual effect that we want. So really what our reverse help is doing is just pulling the front element off the list and gluing it onto the answer that I'm building up, onto the front of the element that I'm building up. So it actually works out fairly well. Alrighty. So that's what's going on here. We're pulling the front element off of the, the list that we're processing and gluing it onto the answer that we've built up so far. And that's all that's taking place. So this use of a helper function can be pretty handy. These are called accumulators, these uh, extra parameters that we're adding to create a helper function. And we will come back and spend some time on that very soon. All right. I kind of delayed talking about arrays themselves, right? We looked at uh, lists and we looked at vectors, but we kind of skipped the part in the middle where we had arrays. So arrays can be multi-dimensional or single dimensional. And there's some different functions that we can use for each of them. So there's a make array function where I tell it the dimensions of the array. And it's basically just sets aside space for the size of array that I want. So if I want an array with you know, three rows and four columns, I say make an array, and so I pass it a list of the dimensions. And you can make a three-dimensional array, a four-dimensional array, a five-dimensional array. Of course, the amount of space it takes up is going to uh, grow pretty quickly, but you can do this. Uh, you can pass additional parameters that tell it uh, create an array and initialize the contents to something specific. So the syntax we'll come back and talk about when we get into structures and things, but uh, the syntax is to specify colon and then this keyword initial element and then whatever the value is. And this value can be anything, right? It can be a nil, it can be a 27, it can be a, a list of, un, of its own. There's an array dimensions function that allows you to get a copy of this dimension list. So it just tells you, it gives you back a list that says, here's the dimensions of the array that you're looking at. You can look at the size of one specific dimension. So array dimension, so the same idea, but just without that S and your array and which dimension you're interested in. So zero will give you back the first dimension. One will give you back the second, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you can create arrays. You can look at the dimensionality of them, which is going to be useful if you're, you know, if somebody passes you an array in uh, as a parameter to a function inside the function, you want to make sure, okay, is it actually an array, an array, what are the dimensions, etc. And then again, there are specific functions built in to let you look up what's in a specific position of a multidimensional array. So um, a ref and then the array that you're interested in, and then the positions. And of course, these have to match the dimensionality that you've got for your array. So this is, if you were thinking in C terms, this would be like looking at the uh, the ith row and the jth, the jth column in the ith row. And of course, again, you can use setf to say, okay, well, I want to set the value 
that's in the array in some row and column or whatever the dimensions happen to be. So similar sort of idea. All right, I think that's where we'll leave it. There are lots of other functions that are built in for dealing with lists and strings and vectors and there's bit vectors, um, arrays, all sorts of other things. These are, the ones we've gone through are kind of the meat and potatoes version. So uh, these are all things that we're gonna be working with fairly regularly and ones that you should become comfortable with. But by all means, you know, do some exploring and see what else is out there and what you can make use of. Alrighty, that seems like a good place to leave it for now.